the kids are good today. Ready to worship the Lord, right? For you tonight, we worship you because you're worthy, because you have done great things. And um, Lord, I pray that we would remember that, that you are the God who moves mountains. You are the God that wipes away every tear. You are the God that loves us the one that knows us and loves us anyway. We just come before you tonight and ask that you would meet us here. You would hear our hearts cry. You would answer prayers, God. You would touch lives. You would encourage. You would strengthen. You would convict. Um, you would bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Lingers longer than the night when the shadows feel like giants. Are you chasing me down? Tell me. Too good to let me go. 
Thank you, Lord, that you're a good God that we can worship with our lives, with our voices, with our words, with our hearts. Thank you, God, care for us the ways that you protect us and guard us. We thank you that you're a righteous and a holy God, and that even if in this world, in this time, we see so many displays of the fallen nature of mankind. We can see so much wickedness. But God, to know that you can save, that you can rescue, that you can heal, God, and to know that one day you'll put an end to all the wickedness. And we'll be in your presence for eternity completely restored to you, enjoying your majesty, your beauty, your holiness. Father, as we gather, would you encourage our hearts, God? Would you heal those that are in need of healing, God? Would you pour forth your spirit upon us? God, for we desire to hear from you, God. Pour out your spirit upon our children. Pour out your spirit upon our teens. Pour out your spirit upon us, so-called adults here in the sanctuary, Lord, because we're all really just your kids. And we desire to hear from you, God. We need a word from you. We need a move of your spirit within our lives. So God, encourage those that need encouragement, God. Rebuke those that need a rebuking, Lord, but... Have your way within this time and within our hearts, Lord, and overwhelm us. Good evening. Wow. Duds. You're a bunch of duds. Try it again. Good evening. Oh, that's better. Okay, good for you. Uh, all right. Uh, let's. We have some announcements, but I can go over those uh, after Kids Church and Youth Group uh, dismiss. Everybody else say hello to somebody, uh, and then we'll get started after that. Okay, um, let's see, got a few announcements for you. Uh, this Sunday will be on Sunday, basically. We'll take those and, and have them in there on Monday. Uh, also, uh, this Sunday, um, in case you're unaware of the timing, um, Monday will already be Harvest Fest. So Sunday, after second service, uh, Pastor Chris, yeah, it's already that time. Pastor Chris is going to start tearing down if anybody wants to hang out and help with tearing down. Uh, and then we won't start setting up until Monday uh, about uh, if anybody wants to serve for that, you may. Uh, there's no food. Food will be taken care of at a different location right after the service. Uh, but if you want to come and be a greeter, uh, you know, something like that, open the door for somebody, that would be cool. Uh, the funeral, I believe, starts at 1 o'clock. Is that right? All right, uh, funeral starts right at 1 o'clock, uh, and that's going to be for Jerry Pack Sr. Uh, and then Sunday, obviously, is church, uh, and then after church, we'll be breaking down, and then Monday, setting up uh, for 
um, Harvest Fest. So we could use help for teardown. We could use help for setup, uh, all of those sort of things. Also, uh, th we could always use more candy, of course. Uh, so if you uh, want to bring in some candy for Monday, that would be amazing as well. Um, let's see. Uh, I do have an update on Luke. Um, I've uh, been in contact with Josie. Uh, he is doing much better. Uh, he's now out of ICU. He has a couple of more days in the hospital, and then they'll take him to a rehabilitation uh, place. Uh, but he has some broken ribs, a bruised uh, lung. Um, like I said, I think 17 uh, staples in his head. Uh, still some bleeding there, but uh, it seems to be kind of under control. So uh, continue praying for, for them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else. There's, there's, there's a lot of other stuff. There's a bunch of prayer stuff, really. Um, uh, also, um, uh, for the, the funeral, there'll be a, a group cleaning the church here 8 a.m. on Saturday morning to prep for the funeral. So if you're available to help, uh, you know, if you, if you think you're not qualified for that, uh, I bet you can push a broom or a mop or uh, clean windows and uh, there would be a, a lot of gratitude for that. So um, let me see what else. Uh, again, just a lot of prayer stuff. Uh, be praying. I, I told you guys before, be praying where we are uh, um, actively trying to figure out a, a good uh, homeschool solution for uh, not just the folks in our church, but for the folks. Just be praying with us. I don't want to throw out too much of that just yet, all right? Um, Isaiah 25. Let's do this. Here's the deal. I know that we always stand when we read the word, and I, I don't want things to become just a habit we do. And then I want you to listen to these words as I, as I read them. Um, as we get to Isaiah 25, uh, you know, we've looked at the judgment of God upon the nations. We've looked in the last chapter at the judgment of God upon the entire earth during the Great Tribulation even ending with God's judgment upon Satan as well as the principalities and powers uh, that follow him. Uh, but now we come to what is really a psalm or a, or a song. And I really want you, you know, as you, as, as that's, that's wonderful that you stand for the word, but I, I really want you to listen to these words. Don't just stand because it's a thing we do. We, we don't want to fall into just some, you know, outward religious behavior where there's not an inward work of the Spirit. Listen to this, Isaiah 25. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and true. For you have made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you. For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat in the shadow of a cloud. The song of the terrible ones will be diminished. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice Pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of uh, fat things full of morrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord will rest. And Moab will be trampled down under him, as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. And he will spread out his hands in their midst as a swimmer reaches out to swim, and he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands. The fortress of the high fort of your... Lord, you are a good... And you have great plans in store. There will be a time, God, of true righteousness. There will be a time, God, where we are rid of the, of the, the, the faults and failures of our, of our flesh, Lord. There will be a time when we're fully restored to you. There is a time coming, God, where we will be 
face to face with you where you, God, will put an end. God, we, we pray that tonight you would speak to our hearts. You would have your way within us. That we would leave refreshed. That we would leave, God, having spent time with you and you with us. So, Lord, help us, God, to surrender our lives, our hearts, our minds, our schedules, all of it, God, just to sit at your feet this night and to hear from you. God, I pray that there would be no distractions, God, tonight. That, Lord, the, the, the traffic outside would not distract, Lord. That the worries or the fears or the burdens or, or all this stuff in our lives, God, would not distract, Lord. I pray, God, that, uh, Lord, even that there would be uh, no cell service available in the room tonight, God. That, that we would have no distractions and that we could just sit at your feet and receive from you this night. For we love you and we thank you and we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So again, this is an interesting chapter for us. We have been looking at the righteous judgments of God upon the nations, upon the whole world at the end of the age that Isaiah has been showing us. And remember, these are things that Isaiah has seen. This isn't like Isaiah heard these things and then, and then sort of recounted them. These are things that God revealed to Isaiah that he watched happen, and now Isaiah is laying them out for us. And it's very, very interesting because even as we've looked at the way God will judge the world at the end of the age during the Great Tribulation, Isaiah now breaks out in a song as he has this great perspective on the holiness of God in bringing forth his righteous judgment upon those who have determined to rebel against God. Now, Isaiah, having this proper perspective on things, having been shown such a broad picture of the things uh, to come, now it is, it is, there's some argument here. Is this Isaiah's song that he breaks forth into? Or is this a, a description of the song from the last chapter there in verse 14 where it says there, uh, they shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. We, we're, we're not, it doesn't really matter, but because it seems like even if Isaiah is singing this, this is a song that we're all going to end up singing. So, so it's this beautiful praise to God that's here. And, and notice the way that the song begins. And, and I don't want you to miss this. He says, Oh Lord, you are my God. And here's the thing, right? Like, we, we almost can read this as like, well, yeah, I know, like, but that, that phrase is all over the place in the Bible. Oh, Lord, you're my God. It's all over the Psalms. It's, it's in the Old Testament. I mean, there, there's probably places in the New Testament like this. Oh, Lord, you are my God. Yes, but this is an outpouring of praise to God. That This song of praise can be sung that says, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. It's not man that declares, God, you'll be my God, I'll be, I'll be your, your person. No, no, no. It is God that declares that he would be our God and we would be his people. God is not far away. The person that sings this, sings this because they know God is very near. God has not hidden himself. But as the psalmist declares... In Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, now, now listen, as we get ready to read through, through a few verses of Psalm 46, re remember that all of this comes on the hills of Isaiah watching what happens in the Great Tribulation. You understand, this isn't, this isn't during, you know, uh, good, happy times that Isaiah, Isaiah is watching the righteous judgment of God take place. And he says, oh Lord, you are my God. He understands that God, who God is, that God is near, that God is not far, that, that, that God is his helper, that God is the one that is with him through all things. Even as he watches the great tribulation take place, even knowing that those that would turn to God, even in the tribulation age, God would be their refuge, their strength, their rescue. So the psalmist declares, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. It means pause, reflect. There is a river whose streams shall, God shall help her just at the break of dawn. 
nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jesus is our refuge. Selah. Isn't that beautiful? And, 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 and we will sing at some point, Oh, Lord, you are my God. You're the one that's always been present, the one that's always been my help, the one that has seen me through everything, Lord. And therefore, the song continues with this understanding that the Lord is our God. And notice what it says next. I will exalt you. Do you understand? I will. You're my God, therefore I will choose to exalt you. I will choose to praise your name. Why? Because God has done wonderful things. Because his counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. He says, I will exalt. And the idea of exalting is to raise up to the highest place in my heart. I will exalt you, Lord. I will praise your name. That'll be what I do. That'll be the choice that I make. Because the worship of God with, with, our, with our lives, with our words, the worship of God in our hearts, with our songs, it's always a personal decision. You understand, nobody else can worship God for me. Nobody else can worship God on my behalf. Nor can I go and worship God for somebody else. You understand, it's my choice to worship God. It's my choice to exalt the Lord. It's your choice. That's either something you do or that's something that you decide you don't want to do. And here, this song will be sung by those whose God is the Lord. And because God is our Lord, we will exalt Him. We will worship Him. We will praise Him. An outpouring of worship will always take place in the heart of the person who truly knows God. You understand, you cannot help but to worship God for who He is. And for all that he has done for you. We know this all too well as those who have been saved by God's grace through the blood shed by his only begotten son. Jesus Christ. The one who died on our behalf. There's this great lyric in a song that we sometimes sing here. It says, I won't let the rocks cry out in my place. And it's taken from, from, from that That uh, place there in Luke 19, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. And in that scene, as you know, Jesus, in fulfillment of Zechariah, ride over them as they they break out palm branches and wave them as a sign of victory, as a sign of a royal treatment for Jesus, if you will. And at the same time, they're singing out the Psalms of Ascent and the Pharisees were enraged. I don't know what's up with this microphone tonight. And the Pharisees were enraged with jealousy. And they told Jesus to rebuke his disciples. But he answered and said to them in Luke 19, 40, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You understand, we choose to exalt the Lord. We choose to praise the Lord because God is our God. That's a cry of our hearts. It is very fitting for God's people to exalt and to praise His name. Now again, notice, while praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. In the righteous judgment of God, He has done wonderful things. In our daily lives, He has done wonderful things. And really the question has to be sort of asked of each of us. What wonderful things has God done for you personally that you can confess back to the Lord about, that you can praise God for? Because if if you don't have a, a list of things that God has done, wonderful things that God has done, and not acknowledge what God has done, then you won't be one that on that last day is worshiping God in this way. You'll be one that instead is worshiping yourself and worshiping your idols. You see, we should all be able to recount back to the Lord the wonderful things that he has done. Moses, he said it like this in Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? 
who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. God has always been doing wonderful things for his people. But it's not just that. It's not just that God has done good things for his people. Notice why else there'll be praise, exaltation. Because your counsels of old are faithfulness and true. His counsels, his word, the very word of God is faithfulness and truth. But the word of God doesn't change. There is, there, there is, there is no higher thing than the word of God, if you will, as far as what, what you can dig into at home. There's, you, you don't have any other book you can open but the word of God that, that, is, that is this deep and this rich and, and draws you close to God. You don't have any. And, and what's interesting is sort of in the context uh, of the last chapter, the idea is that the counsels of old are faithful and true in, in that the things God declared would take place will eventually happen just as he declared, though they won't take place for many years after the time of Isaiah. But these are things that God already determined and declared. And thus everything that's in the counsels of God, in the word of God, they will take place. It is an absolute certainty. There is no reading the Bible and going, huh, I hope that takes place. I wonder if that will ever happen. It's already declared because God said so. This is, again, for the person whose God is the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You can bet everything on this. Not, not that you're going to be a bad You bet your bad day on it and your good day on it. You bet your whole life on this. This doesn't change. This is faithful. This is true. Everybody else's little thing will change. Even when it seems to be a great, big, you know, huge deal, eventually it will go away. Everything else will fade, but the Word of God will never fade. Now watch what he says next. He says, for you will never be rebuilt. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible or terrifying nations will fear you. You understand, there's nothing too big or too built up for the Lord. No, 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 all these things that stand against the Lord, they'll come to an end. You have to understand that God created all the components of this world. Therefore, there is nothing made or built that God cannot easily put to ruin. But God isn't a bully who's just kicking over sandcastles that the kids are building on the playground. This is about God's perfect, righteous judgment. It is neither too harsh nor too lenient. Nor will it come too early, nor will it come too late, but at the perfect time according to what God has already declared. What city or palace is this talking about here? Well, all of them that are in rebellion against God from the very first to the very last throughout human history. None will escape the judgment of God. And that's a good thing. Because as none will stand against the judgment of God, the result will be twofold. The strong people... This seems to be those who are strong in the Lord will glorify God. Explain, perhaps some will turn to the Lord and yet some others will not. But there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Well, watch as this continues here. Verse 4. For you have been a strength to the poor. Just these, these various ways that God has been so good and so gracious to people. For you have been a strength to the poor. Even to the poor, even to those that didn't have, you know, what, what, what everybody else had. It was God that was their strength. You've been a strength to the needy in his distress. You, you, here's the thing, man. I know this firsthand. And, and it didn't really matter. Like, I could tell you, I remember there were, there were times when, you know, Man, early on, we didn't have nothing. We didn't have anything to eat in the house, honestly. Like, they, they were just tough times like that. And the Lord always provided so we didn't go without a meal. Sometimes we'd come home and there'd just be a bag of, like, you know, 
And it doesn't matter if your distress is a physical need, like, oh man, I need food, or if your, or your distress is a mental need, like, Lord, I'm going to lose my mind unless you... No, it doesn't matter if, if it's an emotional need. Uh, Lord, I'm so broken hearted, I can't handle this. It, it doesn't matter if it's a spiritual need. The Lord always comes through for His people. God is a refuge from the storm. So even when the storms come, the Lord's better than an umbrella. The Lord's better than a rain jacket. The Lord's better than anything else. He's a refuge from the coming storms even. And notice this. We appreciate this being, you know, desert people, right? Because this would be a huge deal for those in Israel. The Lord is a shade from the heat. And the Lord, for for the blast of the terrible ones, is a storm against the wall. These are, these are things that the Lord cares for us about. You will reduce the noise of the aliens or of the, the outsiders, those who come against, as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud. It's, it's very interesting. It's the, 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 the Lord is all of these things for us, and then for those that are against the Lord, the, the Lord is, is quite the opposite. He's heat in the shadow of a cloud. He's heat in a dry place. The song of the terrible ones will be diminished, humbled. Those that boast against the Lord, the Lord will humble them. This is is such a a beautiful, encouraging word that's here. And, And look, it's beautiful and encouraging if the Lord is your God, right? If the Lord is not your God, this is not beautiful or encouraging for you. If the Lord is not your God, this is like the worst news ever. Do you understand? Like, it's written in such a way as to say, for those of you that are my people, oh, and by the way, any of you can come and be my people. Later on in in Isaiah 45, he's going to say, look, if anybody would just come to me realizing that I'm the God of salvation. And then he goes on to say, there's coming a time in which all the knees will bow and every tongue will make a a profession of, 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 of faith in me as the Savior. It's it's in grace and of his mercy and of his salvation that you don't have to be against God because even though you're currently against God, he would love to make you a part of his family. It's, it's, it's incredible. No, notice verse 6. And in this mountain, now again, we, we've seen this imagery before in the book of Isaiah. Some look at this and go, oh, it's a mountain, so it must be here on, you know, right now in the earth and all this. But, but we're looking at the mountain of the Lord. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines, on the leaves. There is a future feast prepared for us that will be unlike any other that you have ever been to. I like the way the CSB sort of puts this into more modern language. It says, On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine. Revelation chapter 19. Starting in verse 5, then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. When will this take place? At, at, at the end of the age, after the, the battle of Armageddon, you know, the whole thing there. Make for all the people that are his a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well defined, uh, refined wines on the lees. 
And it's this picture that's always so beautiful that we think about, at least I think about, every time that we partake of communion. Remember what Jesus said? He said there, then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Listen, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This feast will be the most amazing feast ever. And by the way, just, you know, students drink. Well, I mean, I, I, mean I, I guess that's between you and the Lord. Can the pastor drink? Not at all. Not at all. I don't drink. None of the pastors here drink. We don't drink. The Lord's perfectly content to hold off on drinking wine until we're all together for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and so am I. We, we don't, we're, we're not to be drunk with wine but instead filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't have time to be messing around in these days. We're supposed to be like the bride who prepares herself with good works, preparing to meet the Lord. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, like jump on a, uh, on a whole, you know, thing here about, you know, drinking or not drinking or whatever. But let me just warn you, either... Either you have alcohol in your home or the alcohol has you. You know, I don't know. You you know that. And if the alcohol has you, you don't have control over that anymore, and it's now this thing that controls you. You need to go to the Lord, and he'll heal you. And I don't care if if, if that's for alcohol, if that's for pot or whatever other thing, gambling, pornography, whatever it is. But here... In this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast on the lilies. There's coming a day that what Paul describes as that veil that causes a blindness to keep people away from salvation. It's the same idea here. Only here in Isaiah, that veil is over all the nations. But when Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 3, it describes the veil being over the eyes of the Jews of not being able to come to, to salvation, not come to faith in Christ. The, 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 you, you have to understand, the point is that Satan and his minions, the demons, will always do what they can to keep people from seeing and knowing the God who loves them and sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to save. And, and God says, there's coming a time where, where I'm just going to get rid of all of that. The veil that's spread over the nations, uh, he's going to destroy. He'll destroy the surface of the, of the covering that's cast over the people, the things that, that, that gets in the way, the things that Satan ha- has done to prevent people from coming to know the Lord. Why? Because Satan is a dirty, rotten, lying thief. What did Jesus say? John 10.10, 10. the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Do you understand when somebody turns to the Lord, the veil gets removed. I mean, that's, that's the way the veil is removed. It's is, is, is the work of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.16, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's why it's important for us to proclaim the gospel. It's why it's important for us to explain who Jesus is to others so that the veil can be taken away. But it's not about our work. It's about the work that the Lord does. And we merely come alongside that work. We merely partner up with the Lord, if you will, by proclaiming because it is a work of the Holy Spirit that draws people to Jesus, that removes the veil so that they might see. You know the work of the Holy Spirit that, that, that brings sight to the blind, spiritually speaking. Jesus told us the role of the Holy Spirit. John 16, starting in verse 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. It's a work of the Lord to bring people to salvation. 
And yet he allows us even a piece of that. Now, once we get to verse 8, we see a couple of things where you realize, oh, Paul and John ripped off Isaiah in this. It says, he will swallow up death forever. You thought that was just something Paul came up with there in 1 Corinthians 15, but it's not. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. You thought maybe, you know, you read that in, in Revelation. For the Lord has spoken. But I love, I love this. He will swallow up death forever. It's one of those things that oftentimes I'll read at a funeral, particularly of a believer, because of the beautiful promise that's there. It's a passage I just read on Monday, in fact, at a graveside. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood can, shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruption, uh, corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And, and, then, and then Paul writes this in such a way that it's an absolute taunt. He says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, Hades, where's your victory? You understand? Be because of what God has done. Look, the, 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 death of, uh, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast in vain in the Lord. This is, this is beautiful. He, the Lord, will swallow up death forever. And he, the Lord God, Father, caring for his children here. Some of you have kids and you know what it's like when they crawl up into your lap and they're all distraught and they're all messed up and something really horrible, it, to, you know, to them, something the biggest, hor most horrible thing ever has happened. And they crawl up in your eyes and you and, and, and take your hand and you, and you wipe away their tears because you love them. You, you, you're caring for them. The Lord will wipe away the tears. And yeah, we, we, we know this from the book of Revelation. We see it twice, in fact. Revelation 7, 17. For the Lamb who is in the midst... How about this one? Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold... The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And if all that wasn't good enough, goes on to say, and he will take away from all the earth, uh, the, 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 uh, the rebuke of his people will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. The idea uh, here, uh, you, know, you know, God's people, uh, that'll be taken away, but it, it, it seems rather to me in the, in, the, in the context here, the idea is that there's coming a day in his presence where we'll be before him for all of eternity, where rebuke will no longer be needed because we'll be in those resurrected bodies untouched by sin, enjoying his holiness in his fullness. So you can you could take it either way. It doesn't make you more or less saved. Um, but those seem to be the two major ideas uh, of, the, of the text there. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now remember that we started this song of praise by declaring that God is our God while living in these bodies on earth. So how much more will we proclaim the same while we're in his glorious presence for all of eternity? You understand, today we wait for him. 
But then we shall see him face to face and it will be truly realized. Today we wait for him as a people of faith, trusting in his salvation. But then we will really be glad and rejoice as his salvation is fully realized by us in his presence. It is, this, it is this, these beautiful promises of God. Now, now notice these last three verses because they are sort of in a sense a summary uh, of everything we've covered in the first nine verses here. But notice verse 10, For on this mountain the hand of the Lord will rest. And the hand of the Lord will rest. And Moab shall be trampled down under him as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. Now, Moab, it's, it's an interesting, it's interesting that Moab would be the, the subject here. Moab was a result of the incestuous offspring of Lot and his firstborn daughter, if you remember. Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. Uh, Lot's wife turns back, uh, gazing longingly at Sodom and Gomorrah. She's turned to a pillar of salt. Lot and his two daughters escape. They go up into the mountains. Lot's daughters get their uh, father, Lot, uh, in, intoxicated, completely drunk, till he doesn't know what's going on. And the oldest lays with him the first night. The second night, they do it again. Uh, and the younger daughter lays with him. And they bring forth offspring. And Moab was the offspring of the oldest daughter. Now, now here's why that's interesting, because... That means Moab was related to Israel by way of Lot being Abraham's nephew, yet Moab continuously fights against Israel, but about all those who fought against God's people, but more importantly, against God. So on this mountain, the hand of the Lord will rest. God will rest, but Moab shall be trampled down under the Lord, under him, as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. It will just be put to an end. But, but then, again, remember, these are things that Isaiah sees. So, so look at the way that Isaiah uh, uh, you know, tells us this next thing here. Look at verse 11. And he will spread out his hands in their midst. So talking about uh, you know, those that are, that are against the Lord. As a swimmer reaches out to swim, and he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hearts. What, what, what an interesting picture, right? Isaiah sees the Lord going like this, wiping it away. It's, it's, it's this, this beautiful, this, it just blows my mind. Now, I don't know, some of you know fancier, you know, like I, I just can do that. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you imagine the Lord like, you know, backstroking or, you know, like this or something. But, but it seems to be this picture of just like wiping away the pride of the nations, the trickery of their hands. Because they are those that have rebelled against God and have followed Satan. We know Ephesians, the traps that he tries to lay, the trickery of, of his plans to keep mankind away from God. So it says, and, and he will spread out his hands in their midst, and he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands. The fortress of the high fort of your walls he will bring down. Again, it's sort of a recapping of what we've already looked at. The fortress of the high fort of your walls he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, down to the dust. It's, again, this picture, the Lord putting an end. To all of these things, it is a picture of God dealing with the sin of this world and saying, take hope. There's coming a time when you'll know nothing of sin anymore. You'll just be in my presence. I mean, it's, it, it is, again, the greatest news for those whose God is the Lord, and it is the most troublesome news for those whose God is not the Lord. And, and so we all have to make this decision. Will we be those that have all of the blessing or are we going to be those that get trampled down as the straw is trampled down? And, that's, and that comes back to that determination. One, is the Lord your God? And two, if he is, then, well, he's taking care of everything. And if the Lord is not your God, 
then you've ensured your own demise, not the Lord. It's, the choice has been put before you, put before me, put before all of us. Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your goodness, that this flesh will be done away with, that this corruptible will put on incorruption, that this mortal will put on immortality, that there'll be that beautiful marriage supper of the Lamb, and even well beyond that, that we will be before you for all of eternity with sin just a distant memory. And yet we will praise you for all that you have done. We will glorify you because you're worthy. And you'll rest your hand there with us. God, I pray that you would encourage us and you would cause us to long for that time with you. God, I pray you would make us uneasy with the things of our flesh, the desires of our flesh, the sin, God, that so easily ensnares. God, I pray that we would be a people that are making our garments white by living rightly, appropriately before you. I pray for the sweet conviction of your spirit upon each one of us. And just before we walk out the door, if there's any here or any watching, and none of these promises are for you because you've never placed your faith in Jesus, that can all change right now in a moment, in an instant, as the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and told you that you're outside of these promises because you're outside of a relationship with God. God sent his only begotten son to take our punishment, to die in our place, to shed his blood, to blot out our sin, that we would be forgiven, that we would be set enough for it because we've all fallen short. We're all people who have sinned. And God, who is rich in mercy and truth, has to punish sin. And you can stand before the Lord and take your punishment, or you can receive by faith that Jesus took your punishment for you on the cross and offers you forgiveness and salvation and a relationship with the Father. So if that's you watching or in here or whatever, you just pray a simple prayer, your heart before the Lord. Something like this, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I've, I've continued to do things my own way. I have rejected you. I've gone after the things that I desire in my flesh more than ever listening to you. And tonight, God, I pray that you would forgive me that you would wash me clean and that you would set me free, that you would give me a brand new life, that you would guide and direct me, that you would grow me up, spiritually speaking, in Christ, and that you would have your hand upon my life and cause me to follow after you. For I surrender my life to you tonight, and I do so only in Jesus' name and only because of what Jesus has done. Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these people. Watch over us, protect us, get us to our homes safely, Lord.